Welcome to the last ASF Connect video chat of the spring season of 2021. It is actually also the 21st such program that we've hosted since we were forced by COVID to uh, do disruptive change and uh, go virtual with our programs. So it's been a long road for us since April of 2020 with these ASF Connect programs. And we're so glad today to bring you three tech leaders with amazing insights on managing disruptive technological change. Anna was a young leader when she was working at the Center for American Progress, a think tank in Washington for which I believe she opened the first office in California. Mm -hmm. um, and then you went to work for Motion Picture Association of America and um, moved to San Francisco to be at Reddit and now almost five years there. So welcome to this program. Uh, Michelle was at Apple, actually at iTunes Movies, and maybe that does date you with the newest <laughs> conference when you were a young leader. Um, and, and then you moved on to Comcast and, and IBM before founding the Influencer Series, which is a, a, an, in, an invitation-only community of tech leaders, which I think you still run, and you've had hundreds of programs with, and, and it's very inspirational to see you do this. Um, and then you joined Google three years ago, and um, here you are. Sunny was uh, the most recent Young Leaders Conference participant. I will disclose, and people will see it because you look a little younger than I do. Uh, 2019 uh, Young Leaders Conference, the last one we had, we had to cancel 2020. As you know, she's a star entrepreneur in Switzerland, started her own business right out of college has joined a number of boards in Switzerland and is now the Associate Dean of the EMBA in Digital Leadership at the Zurich Business University HWZ. And as I just found out when I looked her up on LinkedIn, uh, Sonny also went to the same high school I did. So there are connections all over the place. And without further ado, I want to hand this over to Sonny, who will lead the questions uh, and, and uh, the discussion with Michelle and Anna. Sunny, over to you. Thank you so much, Patricia, and a warm welcome also from my side. I'm so honored and excited to be able to jump into this conversation on managing disruptive technological change with the American Swiss Foundation um, and such wonderful panelists. I mean, what a round. Uh, I hope we're going to have an amazing half an hour, 45 minutes together. I just want to encourage everyone who's on this call, if you do have any questions, I will be monitoring the chat. So at any point in time, please just drop your questions um, and I'll try to make sure that I, I integrate them into our, into our conversation. So now with that, uh, I'd like to jump right in. Um, Michelle, you're uh, at uh, 120 at Google's in-house incubator. Um, and Anna, you're at Reddit, and I'm going to ask you for starters uh, both the same question. I'm going to start with you, Michelle. If you um, think back to your uh, to your career and uh, look at this topic of disruptive technological change, can you just take us back to a moment when mm -hmm. you really understood what that means? It's such a buzzword. We read it a lot in the media. But then what's a moment in your career working in the technology sector where you really felt like, oh, wow, this is what it's like? Um, can you give an anecdote there? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Sunny. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here. So I was actually thinking about this a little bit last night. And um, one of the things that really stood out for me, and it's funny that Patricia kind of almost dated me with even the iTunes uh, movies, was... Uh, I had been in the film industry for most of my career prior to moving up to the Bay Area in 2008. Uh, and I joined Apple at kind of this moment in time in 2008 where uh, the first iPhone, the one that couldn't even do cut and paste had launched, the App Store hadn't launched. And I was joining a really small nascent team that was thinking about how to get sort of more videos onto, you know, kind of tiny iPods. And at the time, you know, the kind of first generation iPhone. And so we were uh, headed down to Los Angeles every week. We were meeting um, with studio executives. And I remember this one you know, moment, and I won't name sort of the executive and the, the studio we were at, uh, but 
at the time, we were sort of probably tens of millions of dollars, you know, and the, the if, if folks remember Blu-ray and DVDs were kind of the big rage and those were the billions of dollars and where uh, the film and TV industry was, you know, kind of making a lot of money. Uh, we were at this meeting and uh, this executive was like, and we even had our executives, you know, in the room. So it wasn't just me, but uh, this executive, this film executive was so arrogant. And, you know, he said, why am I even taking this meeting? You're less than 1% of my business. Uh, and he actually used even a more crude sort of, uh, he says, you're like smaller than the pimple on my blank, you know, and I was just like floored, right? And so uh, I was like, wow, we've got an uphill battle. But as sort of, you know, even just in a few sort of years, things progress so rapidly around, you know, the iPad launch, the App Store launch, and you saw sort of this, you know, you know, huge transformation of, of user consumption and the way, uh, you know, folks even consumed, uh, you know, video. Uh, it just was, you know, very, you know, transformational for me that, you know, just fast forward a few years, and, you know, that executive is like, you know, wanting, right, to kind of parry and be uh, uh, engaged, you know, with, with Apple. And, and even that was sort of a transactional, you know, business model of renting and buying movies. Now Apple's actually making movies, right? And Netflix and others have sort of, you know, shown that the subscription model is kind of where sort of, you know, people are at. So, so for me, that was kind of a pretty, like, you know, distinct moment. And I think if I'd been, remained in Los Angeles and remained on the other side of the table, I wouldn't have seen that coming, right? And it was so clear to me being in Silicon Valley and, you know, you're just kind of around sort of everybody who's trying to, to you know, uh, be very sort of forward thinking and disruptive, uh, that it was, it was so clear at the time, you know, to me that this was kind of the future. And I don't think that would have been the case if I hadn't been here. Um, also, the other example is um, literally I joined Apple, like I think the month the App Store launched, and I think they had like two people, like literally two people on the business side looking at, you know, the app store. Because I, at the time, there wasn't even a thought at the iPhone that, that there would be kind of like this open, you know, environment. And just look at all of the businesses over the last few years that have been created that you couldn't have even imagined, you know, like Uber and, you know, social media, et cetera, that, um, that really sort of were... Uh, at the heart was at this kind of disruptive technological change. And so many industries also miss that, right? Miss that this thing in your pocket, this computer, this uh, was going to change so much of, uh, you know, the landscape. So um, I'm, you know, it, again, uh, there's probably lots of other kind of examples, but that that one was like just really sort of like stuck with me. And I like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the tables turned. Um, yeah. what, what what about you? What were you know what were moments, anecdotes in your career where you felt disruptive technology um, really had a huge impact? Where you really also understood and felt that? Yeah, so it's interesting because Michelle and I um, both have backgrounds actually in the film industry, and um, and so I would. I would say that my kind of one of my aha moments, and I, in fact, one of the reasons why I eventually went to Reddit was an experience um, in um, in around uh, gosh, probably 2012, where um, there was a big debate in Congress around issues involving um, access to the internet. And, and the way in which the internet was going to be regulated. And, um, and it was remarkable because being part of the Motion Picture Association, you know, a storied uh, organization that represents the film and television industry, considered one of the most po powerful um, Washington DC organizations, um, was really um, challenged by, um, by this kind of, uh, self-started um, group of people who were coming together and organizing online and had really strong opinions about how the internet was going to be regulated. Um, and so that to me was quite remarkable because they were able to organize, they were able to, um, they were able to kind of do a lot of the types of things that you actually had mostly seen in kind of presidential or um, large campaigns. Um, and the level of sophistication amongst kind of everyday people was, was significant. And so um, I would say that that to me was quite eye-opening, um, fascinating, and something that 
I think we continue to see for better and for worse um, across the board. Um, and, and so there's been a significant amount of evolution. I think people have become more sophisticated to like how um, people can self-organize online. Um, but it's, it's something that I think uh, we all acknowledge is kind of here to stay. And frankly, it should be here to stay because um, this is the new means of communication for people. Um, this is the new tool. This is how we all are able to interact, do business, meet with our friends and family, particularly right now during this, you know, as we're phasing out of, of lockdowns and whatnot due to COVID. So, um, so I'd say that that was a precursor to the many evolutions I think that we've seen since that period of time. If I can just jump into the, this, this description of Reddit that you just gave us, I mean, recently it's been uh, receiving quite a lot of media attention, or at least certain uh, certain parts of it has certain, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, organizational uh, action on the the stock market that that took place uh, very bottom up. Um, uh, now, I would almost say this is some, you know, these these are users uh, driving disruption in a way uh, on the financial markets through this technology platform, Reddit. Um, what role do you think platforms like Reddit play in the context of driving tech technological change, particularly sort of looking out a little bit into the future? Because you're just, I would say, a little closer to this development than just about any of us on this call. I'd love to hear your take on it. You're looking well, at it. The, so um, I wouldn't say that Reddit was particularly driving the technological change because the things that were happening on Reddit were the things that happen on Reddit all the time, which is people are coming together and they're having conversations. Um, you don't actually, you know, you talk on Reddit, you don't trade on Reddit. So there are a couple of different shifts that were happening in the broader ecosystem around tool, new tools for people to do these kinds of trades, free trading, partial trading of different types of securities and whatnot. Um, and, um, and so, uh, and then you had um, this lockdown where everybody was, you know, basically staying at home, bored, um, maybe didn't have um, access to economic opportunity, saw that the stock market um, was continuing to um, do perform very, very well during this time where there was a lot of economic pain for a lot of people. And, and so um, Reddit became a hub really for people to kind of talk about that the, all of those factors sort of coming together um, at this moment of time and people, frankly, feeling like um, uh, feeling like they wanted to have more skin in the game and they wanted to have a better sense of control. Um, and and so, you know, I think initially there were some um, actions that took place because they wanted to see if they could actually influence like uh, you know, they have this kind of beloved, you know, GameStop is, is, is a company that sells video games. There's lots of gamers on Reddit. Um, and there were, you know, actions happening that were kind of squeezing that company. And so, you know, this group of people online wanted to see if they could kind of push back against, you know, hedge funds. And, um, and you know, it's, it's remarkable, but they were kind of able to be successful around that. Um, using some of these new uh, financial apps that are available. Um, and, you know, <laughs> as somebody who runs communications for Reddit, um, one of the things that is a constant lesson for me is that if you want to pressure test something, bring it to Reddit because Reddit <laughs> will pressure test anything. Michelle, I'm sure, is very familiar with this because I'm sure with various Google products or things that they're incubating at Google, you know, if the Reddit community actually learns of these things and starts to kind of do some diligence around it, there's no better due diligence than Reddit users, to be quite frank. And so they saw this, um, they saw an opportunity, they seized it, and, you know, and lo and behold, were actually quite successful in, um, in showing the power of regular people actually having a big impact. 
I think that the power of, of democratizing uh, access through through technologies is 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 incredible. Um, if I could take it over to Michelle, um, you oftentimes. Uh, as the in-house incubator of Google will probably develop products and, um, as Anna just mentioned, sort of find users to test and iterate on them. Um, what is it sort of about the this aspect of, of you know, user-driven developing um, that really is significantly different in the digital context where, you know, coming, and I'm saying this as a, a, a you know, someone in Switzerland, um, thinking of some of the traditional companies uh, based here, who oftentimes will first, uh, true to sort of this idea of Swiss quality and perfectionism, uh, for very long time hold back with going out with a product and, you know, lo and behold, certainly not an unfinished product. What is your approach and, and what have you found uh, to work, uh, particularly in the digital context when it comes to uh, developing disruptive innovations? Ah, thank you, um, Sunny. Um, so Area 120 was set up about five years ago at the dawn of Alphabet, and I think there was a recognition that, um, you know, Google had, had reached um, a, you know, maturity level in terms of the expectations, uh, right, of, of users and what a Google product uh, will have in terms of all the kind of bells and whistles, et cetera, and wanting to have sort of a, a dedicated home where really entrepreneurial Googlers could come, they could experiment, but they could launch things on sort of a, um, a separate brand that had the expectations of, hey, this is um, experimental. It's it's not meant to sort of, you know, be kind of fully fledged. We're still iterating. We're still trying to get to, we like to say internally minimal lovable product. Um, so not even like product market fit, like that would, that is obviously ultimately the goal, but like just in that first kind of six months where we have teams uh, come in and, and the goal is to launch something to real users within six months and, and really sort of iterate to get to that minimal level of a product. There's obviously there's, you know, a lot of um, uh, uh, user research and testing and stuff, but there's nothing more than just having real users. Uh, and Anna, you kind of mentioned that real users playing, you know, giving you real feedback. Um, those those are the early kind of folks that um, that can really help you kind of uh, develop. They care, right, uh, about, uh, you know, what you're building. And so, uh, so I think, you know, from from my perspective, uh, you know, innovation is a very iterative process. When I look at sort of the teams and we funded over 95 teams over this last, you know, kind of five years and graduated a number of them, you know, back into Google and their Google products. But um, the when I look at some of the most successful ones, they were they were actually not linear. They were they went kind of in one direction and learn something and, you know, we're able to take kind of that learning and pivot, you know, into, into something else. And I think that the messiness of, um, you know, product development, sometimes that's harder within kind of a larger corporation and, and not sort of the expectation, right, of your brand. So, um, so having sort of the ability to do that kind of iterative, to learn, uh, to experiment, I think is important, but always with that user first, right? You know, Google, always has kind of that, um, you know, do right by users, you know, what is that kind of user need that we're solving for? Uh, and uh, yeah, which is, um, again, the, the, that product development process is a bit different than maybe some of what you've articulated for uh, some Swiss companies. I will say it's very different than what I experienced at Apple, um, where sort of with hardware and when you're kind of shipping things that are kind of coupled with hardware, um, you, you do really need to have sort of, um, you know, a very like rock solid, you know, product. Uh, and, and there isn't sort of a, hey, let's, you know, throw this out and see if sort of, you know, something sticks and it can be kind of a multi-year process uh, to, to get to that. So, um, so I think there's, you know, different approaches and both, you know, very user-centric um, companies and cultures. But, uh, but I think in, in this context, uh, we have a lot of freedom to, again, kind of experiment uh, and, uh, and, and find our way to that minimal lovable product and then hopefully, you know, product market fit. <laughs> And I, I guess in terms of just you know, giving people one or two examples from these 95 yeah. projects, if there's something that people might know or, or you know, where, where you could also give a little bit of the background story of how it, how it came into existence. Yeah, sure. Um, so one of uh, our early projects was kind of for, as part of the first class. So we have um, we bring in kind of two classes a, a year, uh, cohorts of, of uh, teams. And one of these was started by uh, an uh, acquired founder. Um, so somebody whose um, startup had been bought by Google. 
and was looking to do something, you know, entrepreneurial um, and came to, to Area 120. Originally started off, um, if you remember um, several years ago, chatbots were kind of all the rage. And so I was looking at sort of building what would be an analytics tool, you know, I think Google Analytics for chatbots because they were just proliferating everywhere. And so they were um, actually kind of successful in terms of being able to, uh, you know, provide uh, analytics to a number of chatbot prof um, uh, providers. Uh, what they found though is that nobody was willing to pay for that. And so <laughs> and so when uh, when they were kind of thinking about a sustainable business model, what they realized was that most of the the use cases where there was actually you know a revenue transaction for chatbots was happening on the customer support side. And so where they ended up pivoting to was supporting um, uh, you know, at the time, and this is kind of now, you know, more public, but um, uh, big telco uh, on sort of their their customer support and how they were integrating sort of the, the chatbot, you know, feature to help sort of folks uh, with uh, customer support and then when to kind of hand off to kind of a live agent and such and using sort of real logs. Uh, from real customer um, conversations, using some of the Google technology uh, to then sort of help, um, you know, make those interactions even better. And so they, you know, created something that's now what we graduated back to the cloud organization called Agent Modeling AI, and, you, and that's a it's a real product. There's a number of press releases about telcos that have adopted it. Uh, that was something that again kind of started in in one place. And, and went to you know another place taking kind of that uh, those uh, those insights. Um, let's see. We we also had another uh, team uh, that uh, was really sort of um, initially focused on the assistant. Um, so um, and was looking at sort of uh, ads, uh, you know, that uh, like how to kind of monetize kind of on the the assistant kind of platform. And what they pivoted ended up pivoting to was. Uh, interactive ad, so like a more sort of um, immersive ad experience, traditional ad, not sort of a voice ad uh, experience where um, a, for high value type um, products, let's say a car purchase or maybe sort of, uh, you know, in some ways beauty products where you could have this chat like interaction uh, or you could have a chat interaction uh, with kind of a, a company to kind of make a decision and kind of take you down kind of decision tree and such. And so that resonated, especially again, in these kind of higher values. So like uh, Purple, the, the mattress company, Ford, you know, for cars. Uh, and that recently uh, graduated also back into our communications uh, team where they're, again, looking at sort of how business messaging is um, uh, is becoming a, a new sort of way that, again, consumers are interacting uh, with uh, uh, with companies. But again, also had sort of a uh, went kind of in one direction and then kind of realized that, yes, there was uh, interactions were, um, you know, were were important and applied it to to a different um, surface area. So those are kind of like two examples of, uh, you know, of, of, uh, teams that we've we've had in the organization and that have um, been able to have that time. Right. I mean, to to make those kind of, uh, you know, uh, twists and turns. Just in one sentence, out of those 95 projects you start, how many actually make it to sort of graduation? Uh, yeah, um, so we're probably in the same as kind of like venture, you know, kind of I would say maybe maybe hitting a, a little bit um, uh, kind of. Uh, so I think we're probably now about uh, 12, 13 um, sort of have gone in and kind of and our goal is really that the, the products um, uh, continue on and are scaled uh, within uh, within Google. Uh, and so that's uh, in, and, you know, us, you know, incubating, you know, kind of going through all of that, the iterations, right, to get it to a point where then Google uh, can sort of, uh, you know, help scale and take it to, um, you know, more customers and, and more users. Michelle, um, thank you so much for giving us that insight into <laughs> 20. Um, I'm going to take a new route uh, and I also want to encourage everybody who's listening to still, uh, if you want to ask questions, I'm looking into the chat. I'm not seeing anything pop up, but if you are curious at this point, please pop it, pop it into it, the chat function. i um, talking about chatbots. Um, <laughs> Anna, um, just uh, quickly, when it comes to sort of the regulatory side, the political side, uh, which you've also uh, been working on in, in, in some aspects, um, what is it, you know, that what is the right 
this is a big word, but like, what do you believe is the way that uh, politics and, and regulators should be thinking about technological change? Because what I'm seeing, and this I think is true for just about anywhere in the world, uh, there is quite some debate of what the role uh, should be played by the regulator or played by politics. Um, COVID in many ways has also shown that uh, we, it's not the system, at least in Switzerland, we, we realized in many ways we're not quite fit for the task sometimes. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, the speed and the acceleration of disruptive technological changes is picking up sort of by the day. Um, what do you think is, is, the, is, a, is a good way to be thinking about this uh, from a politics or regulatory perspective? Yeah, so I actually think the the key here is figuring out your definitions. That's really the challenge because um, to just say that tech needs to be regulated, that means so many different things, right? It could mean everything from precision medicine and genomics to uh, you know regulation of companies like Uber or Lyft to um, social media, which is, you know, where I work now. Um, so I, I really think this blanket term for tech actually probably needs to change because it just means too many things. And, um, and I think to, um, to kind of have a blanket policy is problematic because um, there, there are going to be a lot of unintended consequences there. Um, and and so I th it, there is a great deal of interconnection between all these different types of businesses, right? They rely on a reliable internet. They rely on um, you know equality of access. Um, and so I would um, probably argue that, um, and you saw this a little bit as a result of COVID, is access to, to high-speed internet and broadband and equal access is quite essential um, when we're talking about at least bringing a sense of equality. We, you know, I think everybody argue, would, would agree that, you know, kind of um, uh, the, the, elements of equality that existed several generations ago, like having access to electricity or running water, clean running water, were elements of equality. I think um, access to being able to act to, um, you know, be a part of the digital economy um, is is one of those things and should be treated as such. So so that's one area. But I do think that um, what why I think we see regulators get tied up in knots is because the definitions that they're using are overbroad and they actually really need to um, to have a more specific focus. And is it, you know, do you think that um, at some point, you know, what is it that we need to do in order to also from a skills perspective, and I'm, I'm asking this also as an educator, um, to, to really make sure that the leaders who are in charge of making decisions are um, on those particular questions um, skilled enough to to make those tough calls because as you say i mean when, when it comes to definitions um, definitions requires usually a deep understanding of uh, of what are the implications and also what does the technology do and and, and what are all the different uh, intended and also oftentimes unintended consequences and then building a framework to accommodate for all of that it just requires a very comprehensive understanding. Um, what do you think uh, needs to happen in order for also political leaders to uh, to step up and to to upskill uh, in, in this front? Do you, have, do you have does either one of you have any thoughts on this? Well, I think you I think um, the more exposure one has is generally an, an area exposure leads to education, I think. And so um, so I do think that um, some of the larger companies, I think, have um, a, uh, a great apparatus, just as many industries have a great apparatus in terms of, uh, you know, exposing political leaders and, you know, people in think tanks, et cetera, to why, um, why, you know, what are the elements here that are important? How do you want to think about that, et cetera? Um, but I do also think that it's very important um, to emphasize to the smaller companies, the mm -hmm. 
starts as well. Um, the, the types of companies that are getting incubated by Michelle's organization, right? Because, you know, I think, you know, speaking from a Reddit perspective, um, there's a lot of conversations around how to regulate social media and all of that. Um, and we try and be a part of those conversations. But Reddit is kind of, you know, as a company is kind of like a little gnat compared to our counterparts, right? So if you compare us to a Facebook, you know, which has, you know, tens of thousands of employees, you just can't compare that to Reddit, which we only just started to have a thousand employees. When I started, we were under a hundred employees and that was five years ago. So we've been able to grow and expand in many, many different ways, but, um, you know, under lots of different definitions, we could still kind of be considered a small or medium-sized business. Um, so to, to compare like to like, that's again, another area where I think that um, regulators and, and, and uh, policymakers just need to be sensitive to the fact that you, as everyone is talking about, they want more competition. You don't want to have this kind of blanket regulation that may actually squash the upstarts. Yeah. That, that's what I was kind of thinking, Anna, when I was thinking about this this question earlier, is that sometimes the uh, there are those unintended consequences of, uh, you know, regulation that may be meant for a certain size of company and compliance with some of, uh, you know, these regulations is just uh, very, you know, for again, a small company may even sort of be crushing, right, in terms of being able to uh, to do that when you've got sort of, you know, you're just at sort of the, the starting gates and uh, you you do uh, not have kind of the, the resources, right, that, that may be needed, you know, for that. So just to kind of think about those different um, kind of perspectives, I, I understand when, you know, kind of making uh, laws and regulation, there's a number of different stakeholders, you know, involved in kind of just thinking through, you know, the, those elements as well. I, I remember I was an intern in Congress uh, when the uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996, so now I'm really dating myself, um, uh, was uh, uh, was you know kind of you know on kind of the the, the was on its way to becoming law, and um, I think that was even sort of a update from the 19. 19- 30s uh, communication. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's just understanding that these things tend to endure, right, for a long time. And like, think about the amount of change that's happened between the 30s, you know, to even, you know, the 90s. I, I barely had like an AOL account, you know, there, you know, barely like, you know, dial up internet to, you know, again, fast forward, you know, even just, you know, kind of where we are, you know, today, which you you couldn't even like, you know, imagine some of the, uh, the innovations. And, and so you want to have enough kind of, I think, flexibility to allow for that you know, to, to happen, uh, you know, as well. Um, so just the, the, my, uh, my two cents. <laughs> and it won't slow down quite the opposite. Now, um, I've seen that there are two questions in the chat and I'm, since we are, uh, I know that we're not going to have that much time and one of them opens up a whole box of uh, conversations. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read both of those questions to you. And then if either one of you wants to just have a stab. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Actually, now there are three. Um, I'm going to pick those where we really feel like, all right, here we can contribute something, okay? And and um, and I'm just going to give you the three of them, and then whichever one you just feel resonates most strongly with you, that one we're going to discuss, okay? So question number one is, how does a company like an airline prevent a meltdown with reservations or internal communication in the case of what happened recently with Southwest Air? So uh, sort of this, this, the dynamics of, of digital communications uh, going, going the wrong way, basically. How do you deal with that? Um, second question, uh, well, if we look at it so far, uh, the first smartphone came in 2007. Today, almost 90% of Americans uh, and I would say almost 100% of Switzerland owns an iPhone uh, because of entrepreneurs, not because of regulators. So here, this big question, well, first of all, is that really entirely true? Isn't some yeah. of it? that's been developed uh, uh, initially state funded and now in the iPhone but anyway so yeah. what and, and the regulator and shouldn't the government just step out entirely and leave it to the entrepreneurs so we're going to see where that one takes us and the last question which is also up for grabs um, first of all a compliment from Bettina Schaller thank you so much for these brilliant insights that's what she said um so that's mainly to you michelle and anna um and she asks what tool do you use to communicate with your family and do you digital detox um so lots and lots of questions just to remember uh, sort of the social media gone wrong versus 
uh, government regulation entrepreneurs um, what should the role of government be or a uh, more personal one how do you communicate uh, and digital detox who wants to pick one of them I can jump in. I, I'll, I'll jump in and I'll try and answer two of them. One is on the question around um, infrastructure, because you know in the U.S. there's a big infrastructure bill going through, and this actually touches on what I was saying earlier yeah. in terms of access. So as much as we would like the private market to be able to handle um, access to things like the internet. And, and solve problems like the digital divide, there just isn't the economic, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't um, pencil out for publicly traded companies. They can't just say like, you know what, we are going to provide fiber optic cable to this remote, say, um, Native American pe Pueblo because it's the right thing to do. Um, um, and, it, that's just not something their shareholders would be able would would tolerate because there wouldn't be the the return on that investment and that is an area where I do believe um, the government would need to step in um, the government you know I think we collectively have decided that people should have e equal access to the mail people should have access to ro paved roads this is uh, in my view very similar to that. And that, you know, if we talk about things like equal access to things like education that are more and more um, online, I think it's essential that the government through things like infrastructure spending and whatnot should step in in those areas. So I actually uh, disagree um, on, on that point. I don't think the private market solves those problems. Um, on the, the issue of uh, digital detox. I think this is really important. Um, it is something that I try and practice as much as possible. I have a young child. I do not um, let her look at screens. Um, I don't think that that's um, appropriate um, for her at this stage in her life. Um, and that means mama needs to get off screens. Uh, I am a communicator. I, am, I'm, I love the news. I'm obsessed with the news. I just want to intake, intake, intake. But you know, when it's family time, the phone needs to go away, the TV needs to turn off, um, and it just, you know, we need to live in our real human environment. <laughs> Uh, that's great, and um, I'll, I'll take that question and maybe one other. Um, so, uh, on the digital detox, it's interesting because I have a young child as well. Um, so my daughter uh, Fiona is seven. Um, she's going to be going into second grade, and prior to COVID, um, her dad and I were very, um, uh, you know, strict about some of that screen time. Right? It was, you know, quite frankly, it was like emergency situations, like we were, you know, flying or, you know, traveling or other, you know, kind of areas. And and since COVID, unfortunately, um, you know, because she has been in a digital or virtual school, you know, this entire time, so half of kindergarten and first grade. Um, that, you know, isn't an option, right? And so what I've, I've tried to do is that is then to just limit sort of the screen time to the Zoom that she had with her uh, teacher and, you know, go back to, and it's hard though, uh, you know, limiting kind of the, the interaction, um, you know, otherwise. In fact, you know, for the early days of COVID, I was kind of, you know, working at home. She, they had asynchronous uh, learning. So it was just kind of like watch some YouTube videos and such. And so I actually um, had her FaceTime with my my father, who's retired, to in some ways like digital babysit. I mean, I know it was that we had no human kind of contact, and and you know it was quite some time before we we saw any kind of family members and such. Um, so now that we're sort of coming back to kind of a, a more um, whatever the kind of new normal is, um, some of the things. So from a communication standpoint, I FaceTime a lot with. Um, so I. Uh, um, uh, have, uh, you know, kind of Apple products. And so we do, we do, our family kind of does a, a lot of uses FaceTime uh, to stay in touch, as well as um, uh, Fiona has also learned how to, you know, do lots of, you know, kind of different emojis and animojis and just kind of make fun, like have, have those uh, conversations with my family, the group chats and stuff really fun. Uh, I do, what I try to do is actually um, take my phone out of my bedroom because I think it's too easy. Uh, I, um, 
like Anna, I used to be the product manager for news at, at Apple and uh, I'm also a news junkie and like, you know, those, uh, those pings, those, uh, uh, you know, alerts and stuff uh, can be disruptive to sleep. And then I've kind of learned that like when I'm uh, without sleep, I'm a pretty grouchy, you know, person in the morning and it's, it's going to be painful. So uh, that's something I'm, I've been kind of experimenting with and it's, um, but it's hard. Um, we were just chatting even before we got on this conversation, I used to be able to wear contacts. Now I'm sort of, uh, with being on the screen all day long, you know, I'm still, we're still a virtual work environment. Um, my eyes are killing me. And like, I, you know, kind of, and I, I know it's, you know, kind of there's, there's a, uh, you know, health benefit. So next week I'm on vacation and I'm actually, uh, my goal, and I was talking to my doctor about it, is not to be on any screens. Like I actually bought books for the first time, like real books, paper, you know, to uh, to read instead of uh, you know reading on uh, on uh, uh, the the book app, which I also was the product manager for too at some point, but uh, just to give my eyes a, a rest. Um, on the the infrastructure um, uh, piece, also, um, and I tend to agree that there's like aspects that um, of technology that aren't attractive to either a venture uh, community or you know private uh, you know, investment uh, and so you know that's where these are these you know opportunities for government to to step in you know I, I think you know we are all sort of built on the shoulder of giants around you know what um, DARPA and others and you know have been been able to to do with government you know funding for a public good uh, that has allowed, you know, so much of uh, these innovations, uh, you know, from, you know, again, the private practice to uh, private capital to to flourish. Uh, but there is still kind of that gap, right, and that need, and there will continue to be, right? And so oftentimes you do see a lot of uh, investment in kind of uh, technologies, particularly infrastructure that's needed uh, when there isn't kind of the, those, uh, you know, that PL doesn't sort of, you know, map out. Um, so I would I would also advocate for, uh, you know, again, kind of in, in those cases where there is kind of, uh, you know, government investment um, for kind of a public good purpose. Um, and I am not kind of the expert on like social uh, media and communication with, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, so that one I'll kind of leave for now. <laughs> I actually don't think the Southwest thing had anything to do with social media, to be honest. Okay. It was actually their own technological infrastructure um, uh, that would go along with their, their reservation system. Okay. Oh, uh, Sunny, you're muted. Got it, sorry. Um, we covered it all. I am impressed with how we're still almost on time. I'm just gonna give you last question um, and I hope for some, some short answers. I'm sure Patricia is gonna be grateful. Um, <laughs> she's already back, uh, but just quickly, um, we all share uh, this memory of uh, being in Switzerland together and uh, prior to, to getting onto this call, uh, Michelle and I even found out that we were both in Gertzensee. Um, which, uh, you know, yet another connection. But what is your fondest memory? When you think back to that, um, if you could just share in, in one or two sentences uh, your fondest memory of that Young Leaders Conference Week, um, I'd love to hear that. And then I'll hand it over to Patricia. Uh, so for me, uh, so we in Garden Sea in uh, kind of right after the, the financial crisis, and it was... Um, it was just a really special um, place. It was just so peaceful. Um, so I would get up early and go for walks and there would be, you know, cows and lots of greenery, lots of space. Uh, and, and for me, coming from, you know, kind of, uh, you know, being in, in more of a city, uh, it was just uh, it was just so wonderful and so so peaceful. Um, you know, obviously the connection, still friends with many, many of the, the folks that uh, I met through uh, the program. So that was really great. The last night, you know, kind of uh, uh, party and such. But I just I really do remember because I grew up on a ranch in Texas and, and typically there's not a lot of like space or land in California. So uh, I just remember be, feeling so at peace uh, walking around uh, early in the mornings. Um, so. <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, I don't think the Swiss get enough credit for their food and their wine. And so the meals and being able to sit around and really have great long chats um, with 
the um, Swiss and American young leaders was, was something that I thought was really special. Um, just a good meal, great wine, and just good conversation. Um, those were the moments that I really enjoyed. Um, and I got to be in tune for that period of time, which is again, another just beautiful area of the country and um, getting to have take these lovely walks by the lake was just gorgeous. Well, I'm so grateful. We, in a way, get to continue this, uh, digitally at least. Uh, digital technologies has, in many ways, enabled us to stay connected uh, throughout this period and, and also throughout the years and across uh, classes, I think more so than, than perhaps ever before uh, with the American Swiss Foundation also here, taking a very innovative, iterative approach. and. And uh, yeah, and and kickstarting this series. So I just want to say thank you for to everyone who's uh, stayed on this far. Thank you for Patricia uh, for bringing us together, and and thank you Anna and Michelle for this uh, wonderful, very insightful conversation. And Patricia, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you again, all three of you, for for your time, for connecting and engaging with us. That is the mission of the American Swiss Foundation: is to first connect you through the Young Leaders yeah. Conference, and then to continue to engage you in this dialogue between the US and Switzerland, uh, two countries that are so great in so many ways and yet can still learn from each other. Uh, people can learn from each other. Um, and, and how amazing to take that little time travel journey from the early days of iTunes movies to how are we going to detox this summer because we are so overwhelmed with the digital content. I think that says it all. Um, I hope you will have a wonderful summer. There will be no uh, ASF Connect video conferences, so we're detoxing as well, and we will be back in September with new programs, both in-person and virtual, and can't wait to see everyone in both ways. And that is the added value of digital, of course, is to be able to connect virtually and in-person in the future. So can't wait to see you all in person again. Thanks again. Have a great rest of the day. Have a wonderful summer. Take, Take care, everyone. Take Goodbye. Care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.